يذكرنا بالحدث الأعظم واسمح لي أن أخذ قبسا من نور المبعوث الأكرم علمنا في الهجرة درسا يهدينا لطريق أقوم أقبل يا شهر محرم وابدأ من دار ابن الأرقم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وأصحاب بارك وسلم ما بلا بجماعة المسلمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته Alhamdulillah, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce our guest for today, the world-renowned Dr. Professor Yasser Awda, born in in um, <laughs> no, born in Cairo, but his parents are originally from Mecca, the Awda family, and is currently residing in Canada. He is our guest here, first time to Masjid Al-Quds. We say Alf Ahlan wa Sahlan, Ya Fadilat al -Ustad. The professor indeed, a contemporary foremost scholar in the world, Alhamdulillah, outstanding scholar, and we are very, very fortunate and honored to, for him to grace our Jumaa today. So without further ado, I call upon the Honorable Dr. Professor Yasser al Auda to kindly address us on the topic Arabic, the language of Islam. Faliyatafadil mashkura, ya fadilat al-Sheikh. Jazakum khair, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah kathir, al-tayyib, al-mubarakan fi, al-mubarakan alayhi, kama yuhibu Rabbu Narda. وكما ينبغي لجلال وجهه وعظيم سلطانه الصلاة والسلام على أسعد الخلق وخاتم الرسل محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه التابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين ثم أما بعد My dear brothers and sisters Islam has a language that is specific for Islam and this language is Arabic Arabic in Islam is not a race and is not the children of Ya'rub who lived sometime in Arabia and the tribes that belong to Adnan and Tahtan and Ad and Thamud. Yes, these were Arabs in terms of race. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إنا أنزلناه قرآنا عربيا لعلكم تعقلون. He did not mean Arabs in that sense. When he said وكذلك جعلناه حكما عربيا, we have revealed it in the Arabic tongue, and he said we have revealed it as an Arabic judgment and an Arabic government and an Arabic way of looking at things, an Arabic perception. The Arabic here is not a race. In fact, the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is everybody. Those who come from Ya'rub and those who are from all over. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam witnessed a dispute in his mosque when a man entered the mosque and he said that Arabs supported Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he pointed at Bilal who was from Africa and Suhaib, who was a Roman, and Salman, who was a Persian. And he told them, what are you doing here? Al-Ansar has given victory to this man. So what are you doing here? The Prophet wasallam heard Mu'adh radiallahu anhu standing up and telling him, you are not supposed to say that. And he gave a khutbah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he said, ليست العربية لأحدكم بأب ولا أم Arabic is not for you a mother or a father إنما هي اللسان Arabic is the tongue فمن تكلم العربية فهو عربي If you speak Arabic then you are Arabic you are Arab Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم here is separating between Arabic as a race that belongs to some man by the name Ya'rub, probably the name came from that, and Arabic as the language of the Qur'an. 
إنا أنزلناه قرآنا عربيا لعلكم تعقلون وكذلك أنزلناه قرآنا عربيا لتنذر أم القرى ومن حولها وتنذر يوم الجمع لا ريب فيه and therefore the language itself has a logic and the names in the language have truth that Muslims and believers whoever they are whatever race and whatever language they speak in their daily language these concepts and these names have to be part of their vocabulary part of their worldview part of the way they define things in the world and we can discuss some of these today as examples to see that even if you speak a different language in your daily life the Arabic concepts of Islam, the Quranic Arabic, has to be in the back of your mind when you speak about this deen. When you talk about Islam, then you are referring to these concepts. The first word is Islam. When we say Islam, what is that? There is a difference between Islam in Arabic, in the Quran, and Islam as we say it in English or in any other language. Islam in English is a religion, is the followers of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that is compared to Christianity, Judaism, and so forth. Islam in the Quran is the deen of not only all the prophets, but the deen of everything. How do they seek another deen? And deen is another, another word, another way of life. And Allah has uh, given him Islam, whoever is in heavens and earth, whether they like it or not, whether they are believers, and therefore they refer to Allah, and they submit, and they take Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a purpose, as an objective, and they become Muslim in that sense, or they don't, and their bodies do, and their shadows do. And Allah is telling us about everything. Subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving tasbih to him. So Islam in that sense is not relative to Musa or Isa or Adam or Nuh. Adam and Nuh and Musa and Isa and Salih were, were Muslims. The Quran is telling us. And therefore, when we understand Islam through the Quranic language, through the Arabic word Islam, not I-S-L-A-M, then we have a different perception on truth. We see Islam in everything, whether humans or everything that is alive, or everything that is even we consider uh, not alive. And we see the truth in every followers of every religion. As much as they are closer to Islam, as much as they are followers of these prophets. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to correct and came to amend and came to, with the Quran, to be hegemonic over the other messages because their people altered the messages. But the original messages were Islam. And that's how you find good in every message and in every followers of every religion. Uh, yes, they altered and they changed and some of their changes were major about Allah and so forth, but Islam is there in the origin and in the core. Let's take another concept, the concept of Ummah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Ummah. وَإِنَّ هَذِهِ أُمَّتُكُمْ أُمَّةً واحدة. This is your Ummah, one Ummah. When we say Al-Ummah in Islam, we don't mean a nation, a particular race again or a particular tribe or a particular borders that define a country. Al-Ummah could be that, yes, but Al-Ummah is the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Is everybody who believes in him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and every believer. The Ummah of believers, yes, there is the Ummah of Al-Insaniya, Al-Insan. Every human is part of a bigger Ummah. But when we say Al-Ummah, the Ummah, that is the Ummah of Muhammad. And that Ummah, again, is not a race and is not a particular you know, culture. It is actually everybody who follows the truth. The Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is like one body, he said. And if a part of that body gets sick 
the rest of the body complains because we are one ummah. And that is why we, uh, we, we care about what happens to the rest of the ummah. Other people who live in a world that is divided into nations, they think that it is part of their humanitarian, perhaps, responsibility to take some refugees or send some food or something when there is a calamity somewhere else in the world. But we do not think like that. We think that whatever happens in Myanmar, whatever happens in Palestine, whatever happens everywhere, this is part of our ummah. It's part of our body. The ummah here is not a nation. It's not just uh, we South Africans, we don't care what happens elsewhere, and we are just taking care of our affairs. And if there is a government, then it's supposed to fend for us only, but not for humanity. That is fine for administration and so on, but inside your mind and your heart as a believer, as a Muslim, the ummah is where you belong first, because the ummah is tied to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَإِنَّ هَذِهِ أُمَّتُكُمْ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا The tawheed of Allah is tied to the tawheed of the ummah, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one, and the ummah is one. Uh, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inna rabbakum wahid wa inna abakum wahid. He is saying the tawheed in a different way. That tawheed is not just about the oneness of Allah, it is about the oneness of the ummah, the oneness of the believers. And therefore, the ummah is not just a nation, but the ummah is a feeling inside you. And sometimes we complain about people being racist. And unfortunately, we have our own racism within our ummah that we are not addressing. And we are actually are supposed to be shuhada ala nas. We are supposed to be the example for others. We are supposed to teach others not to be racist and how to be clean and what it means to be just and so forth. These values we are supposed to teach the world that لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ So you are witnesses over humankind. We are supposed to be the holders of the values of education and rights and justice and so forth. We are not. And we are actually suffering inside our ummah from the ills that we accuse others of. And we are supposed as an ummah to take what the Quran is teaching us as the ummah and what the Prophet وسلم, said. Arabic is not your mother or your father. Arabic is the tongue. And the tongue is the culture. The word al lisan, the tongue, is not just the lugha. The Quran is not saying lugha, which is the language. Uh, al lisan, which is the tongue, which is actually a culture, a, what we call a tasawwur, the perception of things, how you define things. You see, so we define ourselves as members of one body that is called the Ummah. And that Ummah, there is no difference between races and colors. There is no difference between tribes and nations within that Ummah because the Ummah is all the same. The Ummah is different according to what? Here is the third concept, according to at taqwa at taqwa is not fear and is not consciousness and is not um, piety. These are very poor words when it is compared to the word taqwa. At taqwa al-muttaqoon, huda lil-muttaqeen. At taqwa is something that encompasses every good in Islam. لَيْسَ الْبِرَّ أَن تُوَلُّوا جُوهَكُمْ قِبَلَ الْمَشْرِقِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ وَلَكِنَّ الْبِرَّ مَنْ آمَنْ الآية أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا وَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْمُتَّقُونَ When Allah mentioned the taqwa, He said those who are believers, yes, but it's not a passive concept. It's a very active concept. Those who are believers and those who struggle in the way of Allah and spend in the way of Allah and those who help the weak and those who stand for justice and those who reflect and are busy with knowledge and busy with the, the public affairs and when they give a compensation, they give more than what others deserve and so forth. At taqwa is actually tied to every good in Islam. And at taqwa is the only way we can differentiate between people. Otherwise, people are equal. 
except if one has more taqwa than the other. Inna akramakum عند الله أتقاكم Those who are better at the sight of Allah, which is the real, real differentiation here, are those who have more taqwa. So as an ummah of Islam, we are not supposed to differentiate between people because of their color, of course, because where they come from, because of their social or economic or political status. We differentiate between people because of their taqwa. And whoever has more taqwa is a master. And whoever that has less taqwa is a lay person. And we deal with people in respect proportionate to how much taqwa they have. And with less respect when they have less taqwa. And with harshness if they are aggressors and tyrants and so forth. This is, this is Islam. And therefore taqwa here defines our worldview, our balance, and our criteria for differentiating between people, not who they are in the world and what titles they carry or what wealth they have. This is not important in Islam. This is the language of Islam. Islam, al-deen, al-taqwa, al-ummah, these, these are things that we have to use in this particular Arabic. And again, Arabic is not a race in this particular language and to mean the particular meanings. And when we, when we go far from that, we start to lose our concepts, our basic building blocks of the world. And we start to deal in a confused way when we don't use the right words. Another word is al-ilm. Al-ilm in Islam is not science only, and is not information, and is not only knowledge in the philosophical sense. Al-ilm is actually primarily something that we learn from Allah. Primarily, al-ilm is not materialistic. Al-ilm is the revelation, al-wahi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed ilm to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And through that ilm, we can see the material world. Of course, part of that ilm is asking us to go and explore and travel and uh, think and so forth and experiment and find medicine and find uh, business and all of that. But the material world is not the basis of what is called al-ilm in Islam. Al-ilm means knowledge, yes, in English, but a much wider concept of knowledge. A knowledge that is mostly from Allah. And then through the knowledge that Allah gave us, we look at the universe. Allah is asking us to explore and find what is beneficial for us. We go and find it. And tied to al-ilm is al-ulama. Al-ulama in Islam are not only scholars. Al-ulama is anybody with knowledge. And al-ilm in that sense is not only the knowledge of Islam in the sense of Quran and hadith and tafsir and fiqh. But anybody who studies and learns about any aspect of life could be called alim with one condition, that the ilm that they are trying to get is their way of knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is knowledge of Allah. You could be a marine scientist and you are called alim in Islam. If the marine science that you do is your way of knowing about Allah and reflecting upon his creation and uh, reaching a, how great he is, subhanahu wa ta'ala, a concept of how great he is and how much, uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala, organization he put in, in the world of biology. You could be a alim and you are a medical doctor. If you are a medical doctor who's not just doing this for business, but you are really at an awe how Allah created this body and how he integrated its functions. You could be a alim. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ He meant the ulama of all professions. Hadith and tafsir and fiqh, yes, if they are pious. And also uh, every kind of ilm. Uh, language is a ilm and history is a ilm and so forth. And the Islamic approach to ilm is a very comprehensive approach and, and an approach that glorifies every form of knowledge and makes a Muslim somebody who could fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of their knowledge in any profession of knowledge. As long as the knowledge is to take that person towards Allah, as long as that person has a purpose of serving Allah through that knowledge. We have seen great scientists in our time who are atheists. They are not called ulama in our, in our lingo. 
in, in the Quranic language. Because yes, they have great science and math skills, but their math skills did not draw them closer to Allah. They actually went further. Farihu uh, bima indahum min al ilm. Some ilm, and they were too happy with it. They decided not to worship Allah. And as believers, every ilm is a way of taking you towards Allah. Al alim in Islam is not somebody, is not a celebrity. Al alim is a qudwa, an uswa, is somebody who is supposed to be an example in their khuluq, in their morals. And they are supposed to teach people their morals by examples. In Islam, we don't separate the message from the messenger. In Islam, the message is the messenger. The person who is claiming to carry an Islamic message has to be an example and cannot be just giving an Islamic message and he or she is not really living that message. That is something that we suffer from because we don't define alim properly. Alim is somebody who has ilm, but the ilm is tied to taqwa and is tied to wara or piety if you wish. And is tied to khuluq or the morality or morals. And is not just somebody who is popular. And the ulama in our history were, yes, popular people, but they did not care about their popularity or about who is in government or whatever when they stand for the truth. And all of them suffered for taking stances for the truth. And that is what the differentiation really in Islam between a alim and a non alim. Somebody who stands for the truth, whatever the, you know, the area of truth is. When we speak finally about some concepts that have a social impact, like for example, as zawaj in the Quran, there is zawaj nakaha zawaj. Zawaj is a marriage, is somebody that you are married to. As zawaj or an nikah in Islam is a very particular name with a particular meaning. It is not just any marriage that the law approves that becomes zawaj. And the, the logical opposite, and the language has a logic. The logical opposite of a zawaj is a zina. This is how we see the world in Islam. There is nikah and there is zina. Anything that is not nikah is actually zina. And there is a war on concepts, including this concept that we are suffering from East and West. People have a, uh, waged a war on the concept of marriage in Islam and its rules and its conditions. But this concept is fixed and is finished and is not subject to the law. Yes, the law, majority, minority, whatever is done in a particular way, but the law could be right and could be wrong, morally speaking. And we as Muslims have to hold our grounds when it comes to the morality and the law. And if the law is wrong, we say we don't believe in that. The law allows alcohol, but it's haram for us. The law allows zina, but it's haram. The law allows riba, but it's haram. Even if the law justifies riba and organizes it, it continues to be haram. And therefore, as zawaj and the opposite, which is zina, are two of these concepts that are in the Quranic language uh, that we are not supposed to translate, uh, whether in the language or even in the meaning, let alone in the meaning and in the rules. And nikah and as zina have to remain and nikah and as zina. And anything that is not nikah is zina, this has to remain to continue to be like that. And our societies and communities should never change the way we look at the Quranic concepts and the Quranic rules and the conditions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had put for something to be a valid nikah in Islam versus an invalid nikah. And we should not allow the war on concepts that you know others in media or culture business uh, wage on us. We should not allow this to take ground. We should defend our grounds uh, that is material as much as we defend our grounds that is nominal and the concepts. This is part of the Islamic territory, Islamic in the original sense, territory that we have to defend. This is part of taqwa that we have to stand for and so forth. So I advise myself and you, my brothers and sisters in Islam, wh whoever you are, wherever you come from, to give more concern and more uh, learning to this language, the Arabic language. Again, it's not about the race. Arabic is the tongue, is the language that Allah chose for his message. And if you are not an Arabic speaking person or you don't have the capacity to do that, at least the major concepts that you run your life according to 
have to remain Arabic, have to remain at taqwa al-ilm, al-zawaj, al-alim, al-islam, al-ihsan, al-jannah, al-nar, al-hayah, al-maut, and so forth. And all of this has to remain as it is. And our local languages actually have to adopt these uh, concepts in order for us to continue to preserve our identity and our Islam and our Iman. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us. Well, it's, it's such a pleasure to be in this beautiful mosque. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. درسا يهدينا لطريق أقوم أقبل يا 